Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Reverends Jaya and Daniel So. Jaya and Daniel are the co founders and co lead pastors of Anchor City Church, a third culture community in San Diego, California, and parents to a wonderful daughter starting college in the fall. So as you listen to this, she'll be through her first semester, hopefully. They are contributing authors to the upcoming book, Deconstructing Church Planting, Reconstructing a Post-Colonial and Post-Industrial Pneumatology for the Next Generation of Churches, as well as other books, one of which we'll be talking about, Sustaining Grace. Jay, so, Jay also works as a coach, cohort leader, and in other ca- capacities with church and industry leaders in several denominations and organizations, including the PCUSA's 1001 New Worshipping Communities, Cyclical Inc., and Isaac, Innovative Space for Asian American Christianity. Daniel serves as Director of Cyclical San Diego, a diverse grassroots network of faithful innovators and church starters. During the pandemic, Jaya has enjoyed exploring hidden places in San Diego that reveal new and wonderful things about the city that she loves, and when it's safe to do so, Daniel will be front and center in the mosh pit at local hardcore show. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but welcome. Let's welcome uh, Reverends Jaya and Daniel So. All right. Welcome to the show, Jaya and Daniel So. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I guess um, the one thing we have to mention, I know it's you mentioned this, but um, we have a daughter. She's 18 and going to college. And so anyone listening out there, prayers for that, because it's a new world for us. And so I think that's the biggest thing that's going on with us right now. But um, other than that, I think, yeah, I don't know. Do you have anything you want to add? No, nope, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have one of my good friends, uh, pastor friends, just dropped her son off and she's just texting all of our cler- clergy group about how she's, she was balling that whole night. So yeah. I can only imagine, uh, thankfully yeah. I'm not, not yet there with my kids. So <clears throat> yeah. let's, uh, let's try to, uh, I want to hear both of your stories. If you're, if you're both willing to share it, just kind of about, sure. you know, uh, what, what your faith story has looked like and looks like today. Sure. I mean, I think for, and I know we'll get into it a little bit. Um, for me, a lot of my faith in, learning to love and follow Jesus has been discovering who God has made me to be. Um, so my my ethnic background is Korean, um, but I was born and raised in Michigan. So full full on Michigander. Um, when Jay and I first got married, uh, we I would do the Michigan hand map to anyone who was, you know, from there. And so she's she's ad- adapted to that pretty, pretty quickly. Um, you know, long suffering tigers and lions fan. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I mostly watch to, to yell and feel bad. <laughs> so that's, that's my sports fandom. Um, but you know, one, one sort of side effect of having grown up, uh, out there in Michigan in the Midwest, especially back, um, in like the late seventies, eighties into the nineties, um, not a whole lot of Asian American folks out there and not particularly diverse. Um, and so it was, it was kind of, um, it was, it was a weird place to, to figure out in adolescence, like who am I? And, um, you know, what's sort of the, what, what's life going to look like? What's my way forward? And, um, I think that's for me where my faith journey, um, really became a redemptive, um, uh, sort of aspect of, um, finding out, uh, hope for the future and and how to live and so you know uh, like I said I know we're, that's going to be tied into some of the um, church planting and all that good stuff um, but yeah so if nothing else you know that the the tigers give me so much pain and so that's that's where I'm coming from it's formation it's yeah. you know <laughs> suffering <laughs> love it love it yeah uh, Jay yeah. how about you Yeah, well, I grew up in Southern California, um, and my faith background actually is um, 
we always kind of went to church with my mom, um, but my parents separated when I was eight, and she kind of turned to the church, and we um, actually to a church that was pretty charismatic slash Pentecostal, um, really great, really formative, helped me to do a lot of stuff. They were very heavy into missions. So when I was in high school, I got to do a lot of like trips abroad that I, as the child of a single parent, I would never have been able to do. Um, and so it was really good, but also still some of like the theology that was being taught was um, like, they didn't mean for it to be, but very works-based or very, you know, Pentecostal charismatic, so very science-based as well. And so um, in some ways, I think had, as I grew older, like going through, you know, faith crises in like college and then ending up in seminary and past seminary, even into church planting, like there's been kind of this um, relearning of what it means to be Christian, right? Um, and probably more, like we talked a lot about grace, like most churches do, but, um, and it wasn't that they didn't practice it. I don't want to come off feeling too critical, but it just wasn't like practically taught, right? Like there was kind of a lot of legalism and judgment. And so um, unlearning a lot of that has been like where it's been happening recently and just being more accepting, f figuring out what it means to be graceful and speaking the truth in love and that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that's, that's all of it in, in like 10 seconds. I don't know. I didn't talk about being a Dodgers fan because there's no suffering there. <laughs> They're super good. For our listeners who are not viewing this, I'm wearing a Yankees hat, partly because <laughs> I don't have a lot of hair and the, the, the light will, you know, shine off my balding head. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I am a Yankees fan and not a lot of suffering uh, in <laughs> my right. life. My other hat though, uh, here is the Bills fan and I can relate there as yeah. a childhood Bills fan. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing that. I, I also yeah. feel like I have to say, um, y'all are both Princeton grads. And I was joking about this with Karen Rohr when she was on, which is the true PTS. Uh, cause I went to Phillips theological seminary, also another All PTS. Right. So yeah. I think unfortunately Princeton Theological Seminary gets the most fame at that PTSs, but all good schools. We'll give them all a shout yeah. out. Pittsburgh, where Karen teaches. Well, <laughs> uh, share, if you would, some spiritual practices that have been meaningful for you or you might recommend to others. Yeah. So actually, um, uh, for the last, I would say, like five or six months at church, we've been preaching about Sabbath. And um, I think particularly in this COVID world, um, like my father, for instance, he's still working. Um, and uh, we were supposed to go on vacation with him and he does textiles. So he, they, his company pivoted from making like clothes and backpacks to doing PPE. And so I said, um, hey dad, we should go on vacation together because you haven't had a break. And really in 18 months, he's not gone on vacation he barely even had a day off. And um, we find that, like, since everyone's working from home, people aren't be able to take a break. And even if they are able to take a break, like, mentally, they are unable to take a break. And um, and the same goes true for both of us. Like, it's, you know, at the beginning of pandemic, at the beginning of quarantine, I had to be working all the time. And if I wasn't working all the time, I was feeling guilty for not doing something, like, even more so. And so we just really are trying really hard. Like, it goes against, I think, our like what we've been taught so deeply within us that, um, you know, that we're not what we do. We are who we are because of, you know, God and God's love. And, um, and then we work from out of that overflow. So then we don't have to feel so, you know, um, so tied to our, our work, to the jobs that we do. And so we've just been really trying hard to take Sabbath serious, seriously, um, daily, and, you know, weekly and now, um, and, and we, we are not the best models, but we're learning. And so that's kind of one of the things that we're, I think, recent spiritual practices that we've been beginning to take really seriously. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I was thinking yeah. about, I heard this some time ago during the, that we don't work from home. It's almost like we live from work or we live, yeah. we, we don't work from home. We live at work, you know, yeah. that we're when this situation and, you know, many of us have found ourselves in. So, yeah, definitely, definitely a good one. Daniel, how about you? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely um, the Sabbath thing is so present. I think our, our church community is largely Asian American. And so we kind of get a double whammy. It's like the Western Protestant work ethic. 
and the immigrant immigrant hustle is part of our story. And so people can never turn it off. Um, so like Jaya said, that you are not what you produce, like that. that's really hard to get at that soul level. Um, and I think just going along, like personally, one of the practices that has been really helpful for me, and I'm gonna be really transparent, um, it's been super hard and at first I hated it. So, uh, but just silence. And, and I think that practice, we, we engaged it as a family of three, um, even before, before COVID, um, before we would, uh, drive our daughter to school, um, we would practice like 60 seconds of guided silence. And, you know, um, Jaya often uses this image of like, we have all these tabs open in our, our head and it's running in the background and draining our brain CPU all the time. And, you know, yeah, like verbal prayer is great, you know, uh, expressing things. I, you know, we are big believers in all of that. But just simply sitting before God. And that is has been surprisingly restorative. And the reason I say I hated it at first is that um, I'm a total, like, checklist person. Um, so... If I, if I didn't have it on the checklist, but I did it, I'll go back and write it and then check it off. Like, that's how much I love it. So it, <laughs> Man it's, it's my hard own to, heart. <laughs> right? It's so hard to turn it off. And so um, even, even trying to do like prayer that, it, yeah, it just always turns into like kind of a task kind of thing. So um, learning to, to drown out the rabbit trails that I would chase down and all of the, you know, thoughts of this and this and this, like, it was really hard for me to engage that. But, you know, just um, being faithful and practicing it, just trying to show up again and again. And, you know, again, quite frankly, like, failing at silence feels bad, because <laughs> it's like, man, I can't even do this. Um, but, you know, slowly, slowly getting there. And it's it's just surprisingly restorative. Well, I keep hearing that again and again. As someone who hates silence, it feels like that might might be a little prompting from the spirit there. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that. Let's talk about – so, Jaya, you wrote a book – or, you, well, you wrote a chapter in a book, Sustaining Grace, uh, on third culture leaders. And I was going to just talk to Jaya, and she offered the opportunity to talk to Daniel too. And I said, let's do it. Uh, yeah. So grateful to have you both on to talk about this. Um, but let's talk about kind of what the term third culture leader means and then uh, share, if you would, uh, how your church is a third culture church. Yeah. yeah. So I have to say my name is on the chapter, but we really did develop the ideas together. Um, and so he just didn't want his name on the chapter. So it's okay, which is fine. I got to keep the uh, pay for it. So it's, it's great. Uh, but um, 20 cents or something like that, right? You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you understand. Those are um, well-paying books, <laughs> any kind of ministry yeah. book. <laughs> exactly. Um, but so we take the term third culture from, it was developed amongst like missionary and diplomat kids actually from the West who were like going to different places. And um, it essentially just means children of uh, parents who did not grow up in the culture that the children are growing up in. Right. And so um, that's like at the most basic form. And so they've had to form a third culture, right? One, which is both in its like best form. And so um, actually here in the States, like the stories that we like to tell is for those of us who grew up here in the States as third culture kids, like many of us would go back to our parents' home cultures. You know, my grandmother called me the American kid, right? And so in, to my grandmother, you know, even though I was Korean by heritage, um, I wasn't Korean for her, right? And, but then I would come here back to the home, back to the States and, you know, constantly still to this day right people are reminding me that i don't really belong here yeah and so there's a sense of um in christ right it becomes redeemed from being neither this nor that to being both and right you're both this and that and so um i think for the two of us for our journeys that was like really redemptive i mean we talk about christ sometimes as a third culture kid and so um and so it really is uh, just a way to talk about, you know, all of those of us who are trying to synthesize two cultures and to make sense of it and to um, see it in a positive light as opposed to a negative light. 
Um, and so that's, yeah. And so third culture leader basically are just people like us who um, happen to be third culture and they're leading ministries or whatever that we're doing. So with your church then, it's it's kind of that just in a corporate setting? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, most of our, our church folks are, are third culture folks, as I think Dan mentioned. Um, and so most of us, uh, although it's interesting, we do have quite a few like more recent immigrants, but it's usually because they've married into like a third culture or um, they're coming here and they're realizing that they're third culture people. Like even though they didn't grow up in this culture, they have had to like we had one woman. She grew up in Japan and came here as an adult. But she said to me, point blank, I don't feel Japanese and I don't feel American. I don't know what I am. You know, and that's even though she grew up in her parents' home culture. And so um, we have gathered people who are like that, who might find um, just a sense of like belonging through that and a sense of um, understanding themselves better, understanding their faith better through being in a church that's their culture. And that actually is really applicable to even you know, children of non-immigrants. Uh, we have so many microcultures, right, in our society. And I think a lot of people feel like they're on the outside. Um, Dan could probably talk a little bit about, like, hardcore music and why he loves it so much. Um, but, like, really, like, there's this heart for us, for people who don't feel like they belong anywhere, to tell them, like, through Christ that they're precious and they're beloved and they belong. And so um, that's that's our our kind of vision of a third culture church. And it, it plays out in different kinds of ways through the worship and through how we, you know, I don't know, I guess how we form things, but that's the main thrust of it. Yeah, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, since, yeah. you, since you mentioned this, let me ask you, um, in the chapter you wrote something about you know, how redemption in Christ helps third culture people realize their voices can and should be heard. How, how does that, how does that play out? What does that look like? Yeah, I think part of that neither nor experience is feeling like a perpetual foreigner. Um, you see that a lot in the last, in this last pandemic year, um, you know, hate crimes against the AAPI communities and, it's not just the out and out sort of verbal or physical assault. Um, I think, you know, I know a word like microaggressions kind of gets misused in different ways, but um, a lot of third culture folks experience that their whole lives. And some um, good research shows that the accumulation of a lifetime of racial microaggressions is the same uh, net effect as PTSD. And so you have a traumatized people who, um, in a lot of ways, feel like their job is just to just to try to get by, just try to make a living. Um, and again, that's not limited to just third culture people. Um, but you know, as we're looking at the the folks that that God is gathering in our church, and as we think about the people we're naturally drawn to, um, you know, that idea that your your dreams, your voice, your hopes matter. Um, that even if they were told you know, I want to be a singer, I want to be a writer. And they were told, that's so foolish, that's so impractical. Um, somehow to kind of circle back and say, yeah, maybe it's foolish, maybe it's impractical. But if somehow that's a part of what God is dreaming for you, let's figure that out together. Let's make a, a space where we can um, have some open-ended conversations that don't always fall back into the pragmatic stuff. Um, so, you know, when we think about third culture leaders, I think one of the strengths, and this is something that w we try to draw out of folks, naturally, we we navigate between different cultural lenses pretty easily. And a lot of times people don't even realize that they do it. Um, I mean, like the obvious stuff is like language code switching. But, you know, like, for example, I hardly speak Korean. Um, you know, I, I, we have a couple of um, little ones at church that primarily speak Korean and they're, they're much better than me. And so <laughs> I'll run out of words in like 15 seconds or less. Um, so it's not just code switching, but it's like learning to adapt, learning to uh, find common ground with people. Like that's a very natural expression for a lot of third culture folks. And so we, we try to lean on that as a real gift of God, empathy for people who maybe don't look like us, but similarly, like Jaya said, kind of feel like they're on the outside. And I think, especially in the United States, that's just more and more folks um, just feeling like, where do I put both feet down? Like, I don't, I don't know where I belong. Yeah. Um, I, I was interested, you, you use the word 
uh, kind of accumulated trauma there. And that's something I wanted to ask about just how, you know, Christianity has had such a, a horrible legacy, especially in, in America of really oppressing and marginalizing minority cultures and communities. Uh, and, and you write in this chapter, Jay, that Christ does not erase our cultural or ethnic heritage, but rather redeems it. Um, mm-hmm. Has it been – I know I've talked to uh, some indigenous leaders and they said talked about the ways it's been a struggle uh, for folks to connect with Christianity because of the history of Christianity oppressing indigenous populations. Has there been similar struggles that you've encountered in your ministry? Um, I think – I mean I think in some ways it's definitely not to the degree that, you know – um, Native people have, right? Like First Nations people, for sure. Um, I think, though, part of it is, is in Christianity, like we hear as Asian American Christians often we'll hear like, oh, we don't see color, right? Like yeah. we don't. Um, and, you know, kind of this challenge of like, well, if I walk into your church, I should just be able to worship with you unless it's like language based, right? Because we're not, we don't use like English is our majority language. Um, and so I think there's this sense of like, um, it, it is. It, it goes to like not um, as like these big in your face kind of um, out and out aggressions, but really the microaggressions of like trying to erase ourselves. Right? Oh, you, I just see you as a fellow sister or brother. I don't see color. I don't see race. And um, when we say that, you know, like there's this redemption of our ethnic heritage. It's like, yeah, actually, it's pretty cool that you're Korean or Chinese or Japanese or you know what have you that you come from. And and and. He, you know, you were made this way for a reason, that God made you this way for a reason, to express like the beautiful, you know, um, picture of God in, in all of God's fullness. And we get to contribute to that, right? As opposed to you should like just try to assimilate. And that's like, um, I mean, I, I know that it is within most many different cultures, but within the Asian American cultures in particular, there's a lot of push towards assimilation, right? Keep your head down. Just try to like be as American as possible when you're in these American settings and try to be as Asian as possible in your Asian settings, you know? And there's a real dissonance there when you don't get to like really bring the two together. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, um, more of like what we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing. I'm thinking of, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with an author, Elizabeth Hagen. Uh, mm-hmm. she wrote, recently wrote a book. I interviewed her for called brave church. And one of the things that from her church that I found really, really challenging, but also helpful, uh, you know, her book is primarily written towards or for, you know, white American Christians was just the, the importance of, Understanding that, like, uh, I forget how she said it, but basically, like, our words have an impact, whether we 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 meant them harmfully or not. That we need to be responsible for our words. So, I'm just thinking of you know what you were just saying, Jay, and then Daniel, your your thoughts about microaggressions. How you know our words have impacts, whether we meant them harmfully or not. We can we still need to be responsible for our words, and I found that helpful. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, Lauren, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, I don't want to get too far into the weeds with this, but I think one of the one of the real eye-opening things about the damage of white supremacy culture, especially within churches, is that it doesn't just hurt people of color. It hurts white people too. Yeah. And I can't tell you the number of times we've spoken with friends who are white and we'll start talking about ethnic and cultural heritage and they'll say, uh, I'm just a generic white person. And it's like, one, that's not true. And two, uh, the idea of culture is not just something from, well, my family has German or Irish roots. It's like our country has a culture too. And that's something to draw out. Um, certainly, if there are things that need to be course corrected, absolutely. Church should be at the forefront of that um, with humility and love. Um, but then also to see as Christ is redeeming um, the, the good things that we can offer as gifts, that's something that, yeah, it's it's one of those things that people don't always recognize. Um, and, you know, again, as, as we noted on the flip side, without having eyes to see that the default sort of white culture, it's like the air we breathe, the water that we swim in, people don't realize that it's there. Um, I remember years ago, um, there was, a, I was at a, a pastor's gathering and the speaker was talking about, um, you know, we have this really multicultural church and, you know, sometimes groups have like a brochure type of church, like one of each on the cover. 
And we, that's happened numerous times to us, like numerous times. So this person's talking and thankfully I was with a group of sharp leaders who could kind of see through that. And so when it came time for the Q and A, um, cause you know, the, the speaker was bragging about, oh, we have people from 25 different countries and, you know, 15 different languages or whatever kind of thing. And, and so people started asking, well, tell us about the culture of your leadership. Tell us about how you identify leaders. Tell us how you identify and uh, work through conflict. And when, because they kept saying, well, we don't have, uh, we don't have culture. We have kingdom culture. But, but what came out was that it was just white American culture, which in itself is not bad. I mean, and again, I think that's something that's very uncomfortable for folks um, to, to talk about. They feel like automatically it's bad or automatically, you know, gosh, we need to move on because oh, my, my shoulders are up by my ears and my toes are curling. I feel so weird. And so, you know, for us, I think on the one hand, it's more natural. You know, a lot of third culture Asian American folks, like we know <laughs> we have an ethnic and cultural identity. Um, but that's, I think, one of the ways that we speak back to the broader church and um, offer as a gift our experience. It's not just limited to people who um, are, look like us, but it's kind of, as we've been saying, this broader experience. I mean, if you even just think about Christians, the church being sent by God into the world, um, and, you know, Jaya alluded to Jesus being a third culture kid. Um, you know, a lot of us are familiar with Jesus being a, a refugee in a lot of ways, but even, even passages like Philippians 2, where Jesus leaves behind the majesty of, of the heavenly kingdom and enters into the full humanity and the mess that we are, he, Jesus knows what it is to bridge cultures and to bridge worlds and to step firmly into both and to bring people together. And that, I think, as we think about, um, you know, if, if we have hopes for the future of the church, it's to have a stronger sense of who we are so that we can lead with empathy, so that we can lead with humility and love and not feel, you know, we see that the, a lot of um, folks who feel like giving and sacrificing, it's a zero sum game. So if someone else gains, I lose. And that, that feels horrible. And it's kind of like, well, that's the mystery of, of following Jesus, especially in this third culture way. Um, it multiplies and, you know, how does it work? I don't know. But somehow, you know, there's a, there's a gift of invitation to us in that as well. Yeah, that really is the paradox, right? In, in losing your life, you find it. I mean, yeah. can't explain it. I want to ask, yeah. I want to ask, uh, I want to ask kind of about that third culture. And I'm intrigued by your, your, your you know, Philippines too, for instance, uh, let this, what is it? Let this mind be in you. Am I quoting the right verse here? <laughs> that Philippians too, right? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> but I'm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, I'm curious, like, if I'm hearing you right, it almost sounds like what that Christians and maybe Christian leaders or both of us uh, were called to be like third culture people in a way. Does that make sense? Like, because yeah. our culture of I don't know our society at large, we got the kingdom, like true kingdom culture, like the kingdom of God culture. And then, uh, so is that fair? Yeah, actually, you know, that's um, in our church right now. We're studying First Peter, and it's uh, like as a little as a women's Bible study, and it's been really interesting to see like how much Peter talks about like what you know people's identity is, right? Like their identity in Christ, and then, um, and you know, you have this idea of like, yeah, you are foreigners and exiles, right? Like you live in this world as foreigners and exiles, but then uh, to like kind of like you know. Also, then you've got um, the Jeremiah 7 passage where it's like you should live, like flourish where you are and work for the shalom of the people around you, right? And so there is a sense of like, yeah, you might not be up here, but still like there's this work that you do as foreigners and exiles. You don't silo yourselves, but you really try to live within, you know, bringing your the peace of God to all those that are with you, right? Understanding yourself really deeply and then, you know, with love and care, reaching out to the community around you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask yeah. something else too. I think Daniel, you said this about um, folks if I heard you right, basically saying that kingdom culture, defining kingdom culture, but really, it's really just American culture. And 
and I think that's a real big problem, especially in American, I don't know, broad mainstream Christianity. And I, I remember seeing it like in a, I, I took this class on like missional entrepreneurship recently. And it really seemed like a lot of the, the, I don't know, business principles that folks were taking to persons in uh, other parts of the world were almost like just American business values that aren't necessarily Christian, but so uh, I'm curious your th- y'all's thoughts on just like this, this equation equalization, mate, that's the word equalization of like what we say is kingdom culture with really just kind of like a shinier Christianized version of like American white American culture, like especially like business culture. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, Lauren, it's it's funny because maybe back in like the 80s and 90s, I think there was literally a book called Jesus CEO. Um, <laughs> Probably. And, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be, yeah, I haven't read it. Maybe it's a great book. Um, but I think the concept, um, like the, the analogy that we have for what church is and what it means to be the people of God together ends up influencing so much of, of how we, like that, the hows and the the whats of it. So um, you know, there's obviously that sort of industrialized version. Like church is a factory, and we need to produce more religious widgets. Um, or church is a shopping mall, and we're the religious professionals offering goods and services. Um, and I think recently with church planting, like you said, entrepreneurship is fun. Like we love Shark Tank at home. It's so much fun to watch, right? And it feels pretty exciting to think wow, in a, in a sort of spiritual way, we can be out there in the world on the, the cutting edge, looking for investors and, you know, 5X, 10X, our initial investment, all this kind of stuff. Like, I get the allure of that. But Lauren, I think you're right to identify that that, that just kind of plays into the, the old mindset of bigger, newer, faster, like that auto- automatically means it's better. And I think... Um, you know, you think about like app developers who are like, I just want to get bought by Apple, Google, or, you know, whoever. And and it's like, there's something that we don't want to pick up in that for people who are planting new churches. Like, I think entrepreneurship has a lot to say. Um, I'm a big fan of human-centered design. And I think starting with empathy, starting with understanding folks, and then developing creativity and innovation from that, from there, that says a lot to me. I think that's a great analogy. Um, so like when we picture our church, we always talk about tables. Um, you know, it's not to say that that's like the best way. It's just how we talk about church. And so, um, you know, and again, this is this is kind of a third culture thing. It's kind of a, how a lot of us grew up. For, for many Asian Americans, they didn't hear their parents say the words, I love you, but they would hear them ask, did you eat? And that meant, I love you. <laughs> and in the, in the meantime, we've heard from, from black friends, friends from other uh, cultural and ethnic backgrounds, you know, when they come home after a long time away, uh, mom or dad will say, there's food in the fridge. And that means I really missed you, right? And so it's not just Asian American folks. I mean, all kinds of cultures have this. And so tables are really important to us. And to, to sort of step away from that rush of productivity, of earning, of achieving, and to just sit and be welcomed, to be valued and affirmed for who you are. And, and I think that's, that's kind of a funny thing in, in today's day and age of church planting. I'm sure you went through this as well. Um, you meet another church planter or pastor, and the first question they ask is, so, so what numbers are you running these days? And we're like, really huge, 45. (laughs) Well, for our listeners, uh, my son is home, so we have special guest music in the background. Uh, So please, (laughs) please play along. Uh, I want to ask here before uh, before I forget to kind of shifting, you had something in there about how changing our attitudes toward post-Christendom can help us all. And in my mind, as I see it, there's a lot of hand wringing going on right now in our American culture at large, especially among white people about this kind of move away from Christendom. Uh, how can that, you know, how can that help us all that move away? Yeah, I think um, in a lot of ways, it's um, 
it's a movement back to like authentic faith. It's funny because we talk so much about culture in our Christianity. And then we talk about that, you know, as opposed to cultural Christianity, right, which is what Christendom really is, right? And so I think, you know, actually um, identifying our culture, like our third culture-ness, our home culture, our adoptive cultures, helps us to realize how much like Christendom is actually um, cultural Christianity. And if we can do away with that and get to something that's more authentic for all people, right? Something that really is about loving your neighbor, uh, understanding and loving ourselves and loving our neighbors and loving God through these different acts. I think um, that's something that will really help actually Christians um, not only understand, um, and I keep coming back to understanding ourselves, and I don't mean to like be so about like, oh, my own identity, but there's so much of like our identity is being formed by this and shaped by what we do and, and who others tell us to be. So if we can really understand ourselves as beloved, right, and like just our being, right, to be, to be, to be, and, and that's like worth right, then there's this really beautiful message that counter, that's counter to the world. And so then um, I think in that sense, there's this beautiful message that we send out to people who aren't of faith, but also to ourselves, the church becomes this um, place of grace and love and truth and authenticity that it's not been for so many years. You know? Yeah, that's great. Um, well, let me ask one more question then before we take a break. Um, if I can, if I can get you to hang with me a little bit longer here, my mind is still intrigued by your conversation around table. And as we, I think, I think before I started recording, we were just talking about both of our denominational affiliations. Uh, Jay and Daniel are with the PCUSA Presbyterian Church of what the USA. <laughs> yeah, that's right. and uh, I'm ordained with the Disciples of Christ Christian Church, and I know there's a lot of folks perhaps listening. Uh, Google them if you don't know the great groups of churches. Um, but in my tradition, uh, communion and table is a really big part, and I, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure if there's a question, but I'm intrigued by this. This how the possibility for connection that's not the word integration so there's maybe a beautiful synergy between what you're talking about table and and the you know eucharist lord's communion yeah oh yeah i mean it's so funny because there's this like movement towards dinner church right like that we kind of saw and um, we were cracking up because actually in immigrant churches dinner church like not in the same kind of way like it's always been a part of the immigrant church experience, right? Um, our very good and smart friend, uh, Reverend, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Joyce Del Rosario, she has a whole thing about Filipino potluck theology that we just absolutely love. And, um, and so I think that was one thing for us. I grew up in a church where communion was like done like twice a year, super special, right? Like every, like the people wore gloves. We had a, I mean, it was like, it was so, um, like, it was such an ordeal, right? And so then um, I think for us, we we do, we do try to do communion more regularly, right? Um, and it is it is part of the PCUSA tradition to, it's supposed to be done more regularly. But it's been super fun to kind of explore that as a, a family gathering. And so we um, often will try to have, uh, like, we'll try to have communion before maybe we eat together, right? Which hasn't been happening a whole lot during COVID, but we'll definitely do it at least once a month and definitely all the, like everyone's invited. And my favorite moment, I mean, the whole reason why I wanted to get ordained really was to do communion and to do baptisms, right? And so um, my favorite moment is like when the kids run up and they're just so eager to take the elements, right? The, the bread and the cup and like, they just love it. And for them, that's church, right? And so there's that tying in together. And when we tell them this is a table of Christ and all are invited, I have this actually one of the little girls at our church, um, somebody mentioned like they call us PJ and PD for Pastor Dan, uh, Pastor Dan and Pastor Jaya. And one of the little girls says, you mean the girl who gives the bread and the guy who gives the, uh, the who juice. gives the juice, right? And like, that's how she identifies us. Like we're the like people who help come into this space and nourish. And so I think there is something that is really beautiful there that um, we really love and appreciate. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we we often talk about when you sit down at a table and you open your mouth to the food, you're opening your heart to the person across the table from you. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that's Jesus' invitation. Um, so often, yeah, even simple things like we'll pray, like Jesus is the head of the table and welcoming us all. And I think that um, 
that sort of speaks to slowing down rhythms. Um, you know, you don't want to rush through a meal. And um, like I, as Jay had described, like, yeah, my experience of communion growing up was so serious. You know, it felt, felt more like a funeral than anything else. <laughs> and so we thankfully have just been able to get really far away from that and to, to experience the joy, the acceptance and the embrace uh, at that table. Yeah. I, I, see, I would also add too. like, I've, ex- I think like for me, I've experienced so much change and transformation. I feel like when eating with people and that's, again, I think yeah. that's what's such the, the powerful metaphor and imagery of com- the communion table is there's an opportunity for all of that. And that's yeah. just awesome. Well, that's so good. Uh, I, I want to respect your time. So let's take a break and we'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with reverends uh, Jaya and Daniel So. So thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Um, feel free to both answer these questions uh, as you'd like. I always tell people you can take them seriously or not. So if you're Pope for a day, you know, what is what do you want to do? What does that day look like for you? Yeah, actually, um, I saw that you had sent that in the pre-questions, and I was asking Dan, and we first we got kind of theological. We're like, oh, we would do this, or we would do that, and then we're like, eh. Um, so I was just thinking about this morning, and I was like, I would really like to try the vest. Like, if it were like literal Pope, like the Catholic Pope, I would really love to just try the vestments on for a day. And <laughs> I have this, you know, we're Presbyterian, so like collars are like just about the limit, right? But man, I just love that, like the, the fine, the finery of it all right and like the high churchiness of it all i just really have it so that's kind of my silly answer i just want to try that hat on love it the hat usually gets some love so yeah. you're not alone there <laughs> oh good <laughs> how about you dan yeah i mean it's so funny like my like jay has said my mind immediately went like theological and and like ecclesiology kind of stuff and um yeah i think for me it, it's like really about empowering all kinds of people to, to lead and to find their place. Um, yeah. So if I was Pope, I would definitely cruise around in the Pope mobile and I'd be like, you're a leader and you're a leader and you're a leader. Love it. <laughs> That's how it works, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're Pope, you can do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so that's a question though. Would it be like, now that we're interviewing you together, would it be like a co pope ship or would you each get like oh, one day? Well, yeah. we'll have to see if that ever comes, how we'll figure that yeah. out. I'd be down. I'd be down to share. That'd share. Cool. That's good. <laughs> you share. I can't imagine, as an aside, I can't imagine sharing uh, ministry and jobs with my spouse. So blessings <laughs> to you. <laughs> Love my spouse. Love her. Yeah. That's uh, another conversation. Um, <laughs> a theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, we've been again in kind of like, we learned no Korean history, right. Growing up here. And that makes sense to me, right. We're growing up here in the States. Um, but the Korean independence fighters, um, against Japanese colonialism, a good group of them were Christian, you know? And so, um, and they were pretty instrumental in like, um, fighting against colonization by the Japanese at the time. And so there's a young woman, her name was Yu Hwan Sun. She's, uh, she was 16, 17. Um, she was martyred. Um, but I would love to just talk to her and, and see like what in that, in your age, like gave you the courage to be able to, you know, fight against, you know, people who are oppressing you in such a way. And so I would love to just be able to talk to her and see, you know, what was going through her mind and what gave her the strength and courage to do that. Cool. Cool. Daniel? Yeah. Yeah, I think my mind goes to like the desert mothers and fathers, um, partly because I, I, I'm actually a hardcore introvert. So I'm, I'm a loud introvert. <laughs> this is kind of confusing for folks. Um, so part, partly like the monastic life isolated from folks is kind of appealing. Um, but I just think about it's not like a withdrawing from the world in a way that's so selfish and self-centered but in a way that is like for the life of the world around you. Um, I just, that's so mysterious and amazing to me. And I would love to love to learn more. Awesome. Um, I feel like I have to ask you about mosh pits at some point, but let me get, <laughs> let me get through these questions then. Um, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? 
Oh boy. I know that was, I mean, that was one that if you want to skip that, out. we can just talk about yeah. mosh pits. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my, my hope is actually, um, that somehow that will be remembered for, um, com- like coming together to overcome incredible difficulties, right? I mean, incredible difficulties. So that's the hope. The fear is that we'll be, this will be a time where we remember as like one of the stupidest times in humanity, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> that's the fear. So, yeah. 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 Sorry. I know it's kind of depressing, but yeah. <laughs> Daniel, any, any, any more positive than that? Yeah, I know. Pick it up, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll say this. Um, so our daughter is Gen Z. She's heading off to college. Um, you know, we're both pretty, pretty firmly Gen Xers. Um, so we grew up very cynical, um, you know, don't trust authority, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and I think there's some value to skepticism. There's some value to um, being cautious and, with authority and those things. Um, but I look at my daughter and the world that she's growing up in um, I, I, I'm learning a little bit about movement chaplaincy and about, you know, multi-faith or non-faith spaces for justice. And how do we as people of faith navigate that in a helpful way? And like, first and foremost, like the, the way people talk about um, the language around self-identity, culture, self-expression, it just blows me away. I mean, these these young folks are miles, light years ahead of, of where where I was at their time. And I feel like I'm catching up and I'm so inspired by them. And so, I mean, I have, I have hope. It's so challenging because I feel like every day I'm learning a new word. And you know, I always tell this to Jaya too, like sometimes I hear something, I'm like, I'm kind of afraid to Google it because I don't, I just don't know. But it's like, yeah, this, this radical new future that they're, creating and they're not waiting for permission from the old folks or whatever. Um, I have a lot of hope in that. And like JS said, I would hope we'd be remembered for um, like folks, folks like me in supporting that in finding ways to affirm and value that um, to clear the road for them as much as I can. And then as history looks back to say, like JS said, it was messed up. It was hard. It was brutally difficult. Um, but somehow, somehow they overcame. Yeah. Well, that was a good kind of hopeful answer. So let's let's make space for moss. I can't even say it. Mosh pits as our last question. So tell me, uh, Daniel, about mosh pits here. <laughs> so, you know, I mentioned growing up as an Asian American kid in Michigan, and so it was pretty pretty isolating. Um, so it, around middle school, I started skateboarding getting into like punk and hardcore music through that. And it's funny, like that was really one of the first outsider communities that I felt like I was a part of. Um, so I've been, I've been to hundreds of, of punk rock shows over the years. And to this day, I still go. I'm old, but I'll get there in the mosh pit. I'll bring earplugs. I literally wear a mouth guard because I am too old to be losing teeth in the pit. Uh, and so like, I'll go and, and my daughter will be like, dad, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> we have to tell this. I have to tell this story about five years ago. He comes home from a show and he's like, dude, Jay, it was amazing. I was like, what happened? He goes, hon, I got punched in the face and I can still take it. And I was like, you're too old for this. Like you cannot be doing that. I, you know? I let, let it go on the record. I am so proud because this, this huge young guy <laughs> came whirling around and I just got full on, you know, uppercut to the jaw and I was still standing. I felt really good about that. (laughs) Split lip and everything. See, you know, folks, this is the life of a pastor, the secret life of a pastor. (laughs) Well, uh, tell the listeners where they can find out more about you, uh, your work, and then the church. Yeah, on the web, we're anchorcity.org, and all of our social handles are anchorcitysd. Um, I do work with Cyclical San Diego, so that's cyclicalsd.org, and um, you can find all our social uh, platforms there as well. 
Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, let me leave you with a word of peace. May God's peace be with you. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. See you as well. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.